I went out prior to Easter, and I wanted to I wanted to come up with a series that I could preach after Easter that's basically dealing with something that was stimulated by going out <coughs> to Amazon, Amazon.com, <coughs> and just saying what kind of books, what kind of books of the secular world, what kind of spiritual books are the secular world looking for? What are they looking for? And you can find that out there. And I started doing a, a run on the spiritual books because here's the thing, you guys. Just because the secular world isn't Christian, it doesn't mean they're not spiritual. And so when you start looking at self-improvement topics and how to become a better person, you find out that there are, there are, there's definitely a theme out there that is, full. I'm telling you, from gurus to cults, well, almost all of them are cults, and religious cults and just bizarre things. And some people just are writing books with their own opinions. But there's some big names out there, people. It is the far dominant theme. The predominant theme out there is how to gain control of my life. I want this to sink in. How can I get it off of cruise control and start living myself? How can I move forward in life and not be the victim of life. It's all over out there. And the interesting thing is, as you pursue the topic a little more, you come to realize that this same request is the, is the request that Christians are looking for. In other words, you can find Christ as your Savior and still find yourself living as a victim of the world around you. Becoming a Christian doesn't solve everything in our lives. It solves the most important part of our lives and the eternal things of our lives. And the answer where I'm going today definitely is a part of being a Christian. But not everything happens at the time of conversion. Kathy, if you wouldn't mind bringing me my, my water there. Boy, I'd appreciate that. I'm getting a little bit of a tickle that I probably ought to get rid of. Thank you, honey. I appreciate it. I'll just set it down. I'm learning how to bend over, by the way. Did you see that? You, you don't bend here. You straighten out like that. All kinds of new habits I'm picking up on. Um, I think that the philosophy that has been perpetrated upon the American people for the last several decades has come home to roost. I think that the, everyone's a winner. Everyone brings home a participant trophy. Everyone uh, is a victim. Life happens and you just simply ride along with it and you're not to blame, nor do you get credit. I think it's come home to roost. And it's one thing to be able to tell a society that. It's one thing to teach that to our people. That you're just a victim of life. Nobody is to blame. You know, you, it just happens to you. Live it out the best you can. Roll with the punches. Get involved with it. Now your mantle is full of all kinds of, of, of trophies of participants. That doesn't mean you're a winner. And getting a free Obama phone doesn't mean you've earned anything. And being medicated through an emotional crisis doesn't mean you've overcome anything. I'm not a, a, against handouts if they're supposed to be done. I'm not against somebody saying, don't take it to heart. I'm not against somebody doing, living somewhat in this manner to somewhat. But if I get participant trophies, I know in my heart I haven't won. I want to know what it's like to lose and win. I want to know what it's like to overcome and, frankly, to be overcome. It's part of life. Life's not easy. Life's not always fun. But don't preach to me a doctrine that says I'm just an observer to my own life. I want to start navigating. I want to get back at the controls again. 
And the secular world is out there telling us, write me a book. Give me a religion. Somehow teach me how I could be more than a casual observer of my own life. I want to start living. I think what we're seeing out there, I'm not making it up. I might have a different interpretation than you do, but I don't think I'm wrong. I think it's one thing to perpetrate that kind of doctrine over our society, but it's another thing to see what it's like to live by it. My friend, let me tell you this. If you've done wrong, you're guilty. And if you've done wrong, you're responsible to make it right. And don't you dare blame me or dare the the president or blame your husband or blame your parents or blame government or blame someone else. Yes, there are people to blame, but no one can control your life. No one. You may say, oh yeah, there is. Oh yeah, there is. Okay, I'm going to give you an example. This is very handy. (laughs) I'll give you an example. There's no one in this room I would venture to say that is a victim where you have no choices and nothing you can do. Where you are completely and absolutely at the complete mercy of some despot who has nailed you down and you have no choice whatsoever at all, completely, top to bottom, left to right, inside, outside, you are an absolute, complete, total victim. There may be one or two in here, and I'm going to even talk to you, but I doubt it. There are people in other countries, there are people in persecution that are victims of other people's maltreatment. There are people being flayed, there are people being sawn asunder, there are people being beheaded, there are people being imprisoned, there are people being molested and families being destroyed and lives being killed. They are, they are victims, but you are not a victim. You are responsible to get control of your life and grab a hold of the wheel and quit blaming your mom and dad. They may be jerks, but so are you. People do wrong. We're surrounded by wrong. The church has wrong in it. I've got wrong in it. I'm responsible for my actions. And I may try to deny them, But God help me to not blame them on the assemblies of God or God himself or on my wife or on my family scripting or on how I was raised because when the sun comes up and I rise in the morning, I am a free man to choose how I move forward that day. I am not a victim. And no are you. I am reminded of a victim I'm reminded of a man named Viktor Frankl. Some of you who have been involved in psychology studies, you may have heard about him. He was an Austrian neuro, neurologist and psychiatrist that was captured by the Nazis during World War II. Viktor Frankl. In a few minutes, not right now, I'm going to show you a couple of quotes from his writings. He was captured and he, was, he lived through four different death camps. The only one I can remember offhand is Auschwitz, and the others I can't pronounce. He lived through four death camps, and in those camps, he was the target of horrendous experimentation, physical experimentation. Every day, they laid him out on a slab, and your mind cannot conceive what they did to experiment with upon him. Part of them wanted him to live so they could continue the experiment to another day. And the other part of those who were his captors could care less if he died because he was just chattel as far as they were concerned. That, my friend, is a victim. Victor Frankel was a victim. Lashed to the table to a cold gurney all day long to undergo unbelievable pain and torture and humiliation such as no man, perhaps, short of Christ himself has ever known. Now, I may repent of that statement because there may be many people like that in this world, but he's one I've read about. He would go to bed at night knowing that tomorrow this very same thing was happening. The only way out is to die because that's what victims think. It's the only thing you can think, is it not? Unless you ask Viktor Frankl, 
Viktor Frankl says, you can cut me, you can lacerate me, you can torture me, you can humiliate me. You can give me such pain that I cannot consciously stay awake. But you can't control what's happening inside of me. Don't take lightly that statement. This man didn't have Christ inside of him like I'm going to present for the rest of this sermon. This was a man who who was called and had purpose in his life, however. He was a psychiatrist. He was a neurologist. He understood certain things about the brain and, and the way we think. And he says, you can't take from me. No matter what you do, no matter what exquisite pain I go through, you cannot take from me the world that lies inside of me. And in his mind, it's not what I'm going to suggest to you, but in his mind, Viktor Frankl thought of the greatest thing he could possibly do, the greatest purpose of his life that he could ever live, would be to stand in front of thousands of people who are interested in logotherapy, which he introduced into the psychology world, who he would stand in front of thousands of people, or hundreds or whatever it would be, and to teach them the principles that he learned while lying on, on the cold metal slab in a Nazi death camp, saying there's nothing you cannot face because they cannot Take away what's going on inside of you. That's your world. That's where you go by your purposes. And when everything else fails, when everything else falls apart, you still have your purpose for being. And if they kill you, your purpose will take you up to the very, very end. And you'll take it with you as a believer into heaven. But if they don't kill you, they can't take it from you. Even if you're a complete victim, and I doubt that there be any in here, they can't take it from you. But if you live in this passive society, fed on this trash that's being perpetrated in every direction, you can't live without it. Everything is trying to turn you into a victim into a person that does, does mediocre work and only shows up to get a ribbon. I want to win, and I want to experience what it's like to lose, because that's what makes me a well-rounded person, especially if I'm trying. I want to be victor, because I want to know what it's like to overcome. And as much as it sounds crazy, I want to know what it's like to be a victim. Because there's times when I need to understand what it's like to live by the sole power of he who dwells in me that's greater than the one that's in this world. You can't take that from me. Now some of you are in approval of what I'm preaching because you're looking at, you're looking at how the world has changed and it concerns you. And others of you are feeling like you're getting slapped in the face because you've taken this thing hook, line, and sinker. And you are on autopilot. And someone else is flying your plane. And you're in a path of default. You're taking the path of least resistance. And I can tell you what you're going to look like 10 years from now. Exactly like you look right now. Because unless you make a conscious decision to get your life under your control and make some decisions that you need to make by the presence of God, you're going to be exactly as you are next week as you are today, and next month as you are next week, and next year, and next decade. And short of some cataclysmic change, you will never change. You'll hear sermons that inspire you, and you will be in default mode Monday through Saturday night. Letting someone else operate your life. Letting your old habits, your old ways of thinking take control over your life. You will be on a downhill slope, path of least resistance, controlled by your past, controlled by others, and thinking it's all just okay because after all, you're just a victim. Even your sinful past does not determine your future. Oh, I know. I know when I go to hire somebody, there's a statement that has to be said, and I understand it, that a person's past behavior determines their future behavior. 
That's a pretty good sign. But you're not a victim to it. Anytime you want to, I don't care how murderous, how thieving, how undermining, how full of lies, how diabolical, what kind of a person you have lived like, what kind of scourge and pawn scum you have been, you walk out of this church a person that can get control of their life and say, no longer. I am no longer a victim even to my own past. Every day is new. The grace of God is new every day. The psalmist Jer- or the prophet Jeremiah says, this I recall to my mind. Therefore I have I hope. It is the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. His, his blessings fail not. They are new. His mercies fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. You wake up tomorrow with a brand new day and brand new grace, but if you don't choose to do something, you can get as inspired as you want and you will still live by default and you'll go to bed the exact same person you woke up that morning being. We are as privileged as every, anybody on this planet. We get to hear inspirational sermons every week. We get to read inspirational thoughts every day. We are the most privileged people. We have the Spirit of God who dwells within us, motivating us from within. No one on the planet like us. There's no one on the planet. No one like us. The most unique people. Most blessed people. We can grow, but growing hurts because growing requires change. Change is growth, and growth is change. And I'm preaching today to have you grow up. Stop being babies. Stop being victims. Don't ever let your ears hear your mouth say, I am this way because of blah, blah, blah. You're this way because you want to be. And don't tell me any difference. I don't care how deeply it goes, how deeply it's driven into your bosom, how it was drilled in by your family, how psychologically and physiologically it has inundated your system. You are not a victim. And with God, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you want it? Come and get it. Come and get it. Secular world's out there saying, I want some book to teach me how to get some control back into my life. And the spiritual world, those of us who have the answer, are doing the same search. How can I get control back in my life? You got to seize the moment. You've got to seize the moment. If you don't stop and seize the moment, the moment you're in the middle of saying something, the moment you're in the middle of acting a certain way, the moment you're about to do the default action, it's not easy, but I know someone who will help you do it. He dwells in you for that purpose. All he wants is to go ahead. He can stop you mid-sentence. Oh, you still have a choice to make. But you seize the moment. And you have a choice to make in that moment. A choice that will change your life forever. Oh, not just that one choice. And I'll get to that in my last point, and I'm almost there. But I want to look at three quotes from Viktor Frankl. And let you see what he had to say. As they're going up there, let me take another little sip of water here. Viktor Frankl said this, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to do the only thing we can, change ourselves. Don't go to the next one yet, to change ourselves. That is a, that is a true victim. If I absolutely cannot do anything to change the situation, then there's only one thing left to do. I'm going to change myself, and folks, nobody can mess with that. But you can't let them mess with that either. Because that place where that takes place is the center, the control tower of your being. It's your heart. That's where you trust people. That's where you love God. That's where you ascribe faith. That's where prayers find their power and momentum. That's where the passion of God erupts from your soul. 
You can't let them get there. And when you recognize the safety of that place, it will see you through times of crises, even times of victimization, if you truly are one, as Viktor Frankl was. The second quote he said is, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Now, I know that sounds an awful lot, <clears throat> excuse me, it sounds an awful lot like the theme of uh, <clears throat> Who's Old Blue Eyes, Who's the Music Guy, Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. <laughs> oh, rah, rah, rah. And there was a generation that rose up on all we can do. And it's, that's a bunch of garbage, too. But it's just the other side, too, of the people who are singing today. I'm just a victim. There's a middle place that says, you are in control. And you are with a God that will help you control. Don't let them get to your inner man. And understand this, when every other freedom is taken, and some of you, if I were not to measure complete victimhood, but were to take away certain of the things, some of you are in far tougher situations than others in this room. There are people in this room that are far more under the definition of a victim than others. But no matter where you are, you are in control of your inner man. And most of you have far more control of the outer man than you think. The third thing he has to say is something I've lived by for years. I didn't know it was him that I originally got it from. I read his book probably 40 years ago. He said, between stimulus and response, there's a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. <clears throat> stimulus, reaction, stimulus, reaction, stimulus, reaction, stimulus, response. If I can put a, spa, a pause, a little bit of a space between that stimulus, I can turn my reaction, default, I can turn it into a response. I can choose how I want to respond. You can't make me mad. I can say you're making me mad, but I'm the one getting mad. I have the ability to rise above that and take control of my inner man and my emotions and my words and my attitude. Ed, do you do, do, you do it real well? I did it better than I have before, but no, I'm not all that great at it. But I have no one to blame but me. You do not make me mad. You do not make me angry. You do not make me disappointed. You do not make me ill. You do not. That is my responsibility. You can behave in a horrible different ways, but I am not giving you control over my attitude. Because there are people in your life that want you mad and want to think they can make you that way and want to think they can make you irate and want to make you think they can humiliate you and chastise you and humble you and cower you and put you under their thumbs. You can't do that to me. I am a free man. And with God as my helper, I'm going to rise up to a place in my heart where I will find stability and ballast and balance in the core of who I am in Jesus Christ. And come what may, that I am in control of. So if you don't want to go the way of default, you need to capture the moment. You need to seize the moment. You need to stop with the help of the Holy Spirit and take the next step that I'm going to close with here. <laughs> I didn't even give you a scripture. I'm going to give you a scripture that's going to be biblically based. You ready? <laughs> 1 Timothy 4, 7. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of a little profit. The godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Now I'm going to tell you when default living pays off. Default living, the path of least resistance, the easy path, the downhill path, default living works wonderfully when you have disciplined yourself in an area of your life and now it becomes your default pattern. 
There is a place as a Christian where you can live by default if you have disciplined yourself to make those areas of your life habitual patterns. For instance, if you have chosen not to lie, no matter what happens, you just simply tell the truth. If that has become a default with you and you've made your mind up that when it comes to telling the truth or lying or to clearing my name of this, it's not worth it for me. How, whatever your process goes through to get there, you just say, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to always tell the truth. I'll, do it, I'll just do it without, without discussion. And that becomes a default way of living. Then you live by default. Would to God that I would capture enough of those areas of my life that I can live a default life. But until those times come, I must capture the moment, pivot my life, and take control of it and develop some new habits so I can live by default. I believe Jesus had all kinds of struggles and trials and temptations, but I believe the life of Christ was lived primarily by default. That was his modus operandi. He says, it's my meat to do the will of the Father. This is how I live. What the Father says, I say. What the Father tells me to do, I do. That was how he lived. Jesus, I know he had a lot of temptations and trials. Don't belittle his, those things. But he lived a default life. It was, it was a bygone conclusion. I'm going to obey God. That is the way it was. You can live that way. But you're not going to live that way, living a default life in which you're going the easy way and you're bypassing and you're blaming other people. It's not going to happen. So somehow or other, we've got to stop, capture this thing, forget all the books Amazon has to offer, and obviously just coming to know Christ isn't enough or Christians wouldn't be seeking those things as well. We've got to get control of our life. We've got to quit drinking the Kool-Aid. We've got to walk out of here today and say, with Jesus as my helper, I'm going to capture these moments. I can change from my anger way of talking. I can change from the way I be. I can change from my negativity, my dourness, and my sour mouth. I can change from my gossip and my slander. I can change from ridiculing and harassing people. I can change from being the loud mouth. I can change anything I want to do because with God as my helper, I can stop this default downhill lifestyle, take responsibility, quit being a victim, and lead my life for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. So God, help me to become a man that can live by default. So the next thing and last thing I want you to realize about capturing the moment, seizing the moment, is that once you capture it, once you stop the default movement, once, the, once you stop the inevitable direction that things are going in your life, they've always gone there, always will go, you are in essence now, once you stop it, you're planting your foot. That's what this is about. You're planting your foot, which gives you the opportunity to pivot in a new direction. This is the key to everything. If you, if you don't catch it, you can't plant and pivot. God can help you discipline your life. We can do it today, start today. By saying, I'm, I'm going to be alert to them. I'll give you a case in point. <clears throat> Mommy's coming across the parking lot with a little baby in her hand and, and a little, little other little daughter. There's a part of me that I would love to do that again, but not too seriously. <laughs> okay? But the privilege of having a little Easter-dressed girl, which I've never had. A little Easter-dressed, pigtailed, red bow in her hair, bouncy little watching the flowers girl, talking to mommy as they're coming to Easter Sunday. And the little baby here, I don't know where dad is, probably seriously watching NASCAR. And the little one pulling at mommy, 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 look at the trees all white, they look like little snowballs, and mommy, mommy, look over there, there's an ant, and mommy, mommy, look over there, there's the building, and there's air, and I see air, and I bring, you know, who knows what kids do. Mom is instead watching her phone and texting. Now, there's not a person in this room that doesn't grieve when I said that, even those of you that text your life away. There's not a person in this room that doesn't feel in your heart how wrong it is to neglect the people in your life so you can read the newspaper or watch the TV or text somebody else when the most precious thing's happening. And oh, by, let me, let me back up to say this. The books that people are most interested in reading on these topics have to do with getting my life under control and getting my relationships under control. 
I'm talking relationship now. Who in this room does not want that? You, mom, you who are addicted, addicted to this phone, who can't put it down, and you can't live and take a picture of your Rice Krispies and send it out for the world to see. You who are so absurdly worshiping the digital world out there and the, the plaudits and praise of whoever you're trying to impress. You're ignoring your child. Do you feel good about that? And when you're in your home, mister or missus or mom or dad or young or old, and you're at a restaurant, my goodness sakes, you're at a restaurant. You can look at someone's face across the table from you. And you're both sitting there like a bunch of baboons playing on your stinking phone. Nobody likes that. That's not healthy. That's wrong. I've done it. Kathy's done it. It's not because we're saying, oh, I'm just bored. I just bored stiff. Let me do something. No, someone's calling me. Someone's texting me. Someone has something to say. I'm not just a complete idiot, but I can be drawn towards it. But all of us are drawn towards it. And we're complete idiots. You can change that behavior. You can give value to that little pigtailed daughter of yours. You can be in your kitchen at home and set your phones down and look people in the eye and have conversations. You can set down your newspaper and have a relationship with your family. Oh, our family, we were twisted. We were twisted. We got over it. We sent the kids off and all of our twistedness left. <laughs> Paul down here in the front row. He never liked to talk until after midnight, ever. <laughs> ever. And we would try to talk. We would try. We would do things and, you know, which is you just get what you get. But come midnight or one o'clock, he'd come alive. And we've determined a long time ago, although it's not really hard for us because we're late people, but they probably made us this way. But uh, we decided, yeah, I'm blaming, <laughs> I'm just a victim of him. <laughs> we decided long ago, Paul, and you know that, he gets to talking, we don't care what it matters. You shut the TV off, you put down your paper, you keep the bed covers pulled back, but you don't go to bed until you've seen eye to eye and heard what they have to say. This world is about what you do with your life and how you do your relationships. That's what it's all about. And you're in control of both of them. When you're out in that coffee house and you do like, I have such a hard time doing, I'm, I'm ADHD, I can, I'm a victim. I'm a victim. And I can be in a conversation with you, and you know this, so I don't have to overdo this thing, but I can be looking and listening to everybody and their dog but you. And you're on the receiving end of it, and you know very well, Kreiner's not with me. How impolite is that? I don't need a drug to correct that. I need discipline. And I have done it. And I've done it to a great extent. And I encourage you, when someone is talking to you, shut up and listen. Hear their story. Change the way you behave. Listen to their heart. Find out what makes them tick. And don't worry what your answer is going to be. The greatest relationship you can build with another person is listening to them. It's not great because you answer them wonderfully. It's great because you listen wonderfully. And some of you haven't done that in so long, you don't even know what it feels like. Because it's all about you. Wow, what a way to come back to the pulpit. I think it's great. Amen. I think it's necessary. And according to what I'm seeing in the world I'm studying, it's essential and it's real and it's for us. I ask Legacy Life to grow up. And I ask you to grow up in the most unique way that Viktor Frankl couldn't do. I ask you to grow in the Lord and in the power of His might. I ask you to become mature Christians. 
I ask you, ask you to capture the moments. Seize the moments. Oh, you're going to do default for a long time. In fact, you'll never stop doing default. I'm just asking you to trade what is happening by default. Capture. Plant your foot. Seize the moment. Pivot. And listen to your kid. Give eye contact to your spouse. Focus on someone's eyes when you're talking to them. A thousand other things I could say. But this is the message today. Discipline yourself to godliness. And now, I, I don't know what you'll look like in 10 years, but it'll be a lot more like Jesus. A lot more like Jesus. So throughout this summer, we're going to be talking about a variety of things like this. Little quips, little ideas, little thoughts that can transform us. I think my message next week is, if you want to really live life, don't pay too close of attention to what other people are saying. That's my subject next week. They're going to be... Pre- Go ahead, clap. Dude, that'll make me want to study. Yeah. So we're going to try to fill the summer up with some very, very good advice. Very practical. Might be painful. I'm not up here laughing at you. This stuff hurts me. I've had to deal with it all week while I was preparing it. But I'm happy to get it off my chest. And I'm going to go back to drugs here in a couple of minutes. I appreciate your prayers. One of the reasons for the slow coming around... It's not that my hip hurts. My hip feels good. But instead of coming through the front, they went through the back. So I don't know why. I lost weight so they'd go through the front and make it easier. But they said, mm, you look like a man I want to go through the butt. So they cut through a lot of pure muscle. <laughs> right on. All right, TMI, TMI. Has God spoken to you today? Has he, has he done something in your life? Church is meant to be that way. It's meant to confront us, to challenge us, to inspire us, to move on. I'm telling you, there's somebody in this room today who's, who's, simp- who's got a brand new reason for going on, who's got a purpose for life. Some of you is going to be more difficult than others, but you're in control with the help of God. You are not a victim. Oh, can I, re- um, let me review the three points. Ready? Let's bring the three points uh, back on the board. This is, this is my, my little summary statement. Number one, until, uh, that's pretty good. Let's go, to the, let's go to my next one. Oh, yeah, go back to that one. Go back to that one. When you're truly a victim and you have no control over the actions you're being subjected to, that was supposed to be an arrow, but that's how it came out, your only choice is inward journey to the throne of God and to the intimate fellowship with Him to find purpose in your suffering until you're released from it. That's a lot of word. But Viktor Frankl found purpose in his suffering. It wasn't Christ. Jesus found purpose in his suffering. Who, for the, the joy set before Him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Hear those words. He endured it. He despised it. But he endured it because there was purpose to bring many sons to glory. And when you are truly in a place like that, then you go to that inward place because no one can affect that. And don't you let them. Or you'll become sinister and critical and bitter and snide. You will lose your faith and your trust in people and Lord God himself. And you know people who've given up on everything because they let that external trap trap their spirit man. So number one, if you find yourself in that position, go inside and find the purpose behind it all. And like Jesus Christ or like Viktor Frankl, find purpose to guide you through. The second one as a review is until you learn to capture the moment, you'll only live by default mode. And finally, it's this. Once you capture the moment, once you stop that default movement, the inevitable direction things are going, you are, in essence, planting your foot in which you can pivot in a new direction. That's a lot to take. Probably a good month worth of sermons, but there we've got it. Now, we're going to have people stand up today that have, that have just said, I'm touching, I'm going to do something about it. I want God as my helper. Some of you standing today are going to be people who are going to stand up to accept Christ as your Savior. You're going to believe today to say, you know what, I can pivot all I want to. My life is on a downhill track and it's, straight, it's heading straight to hell. I can't simply better my life. I need a brand new life. And that's what Jesus says he will give you. 
you stand today is your confession of faith to say, Jesus, when I come to my feet, I am opening the door of my life and I'm inviting you into my life to be my savior. Teach me how to be a disciple, how to grow. The others of you are standing because something touched you and it's going to turn itself into a decision in your life. It will walk with you this week. You will walk out of the store knowing it and it will help guide you and lead you and it will be with you from now on. Whatever it is, please stand across the building and I want to close this in prayer. Across the building. And any today that are standing, because God has talked to your heart about something to do with victimhood or your attitude or taking the most of the moment and pivoting and changing your direction. Any of you that are standing for other reasons than that, when this is all over and I say amen, I'm going to ask you to, those of you that have accepted Christ, just come and meet me after everything. Meet me up front here. I'll be by the piano and, or around here. I just want to meet you. I want to shake your hand. I want to have a moment of prayer with you to see who God is bringing into his kingdom. So if you would do that, please. Lord, we're standing out of hope. And instead of just beating our chest saying how capable we are, we are holding hands with you and recognizing how capable you are making us in Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have a new forward I'm taking, a new motive, a new direction. Slight changes, one here, one there, one here, one there, until I get a new default, a default towards godliness. I'm capturing the moment. I'm seizing the moment for the glory of God each that are standing here who are touched by God, may they sense the fabric of their life being changed as they cooperate with the Spirit of God in their life. I thank you for it, and I ask it to happen in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.